came unto the tomb of Jesus. The stone was moved, the Lord had gone away. The angel said, Fear not, I know who seek ye, for he is risen this. She heard him say, Gone, the stone is rolled back, gone, the tomb is empty, gone, you sit at the Father's side. Gone, over death triumphant, gone, sin is defeated, gone. If you don't know this risen Savior, I beg you, please don't wait too late to pray. Don't wait until His bride has been completed. And don't wait until you hear Him say it's too Father's side Gone Over death Triumphant Gone Sin is defeated Gone He lives forevermore He is gone He lives Welcome, welcome. We're doing something different because it's Easter and everybody does something different on Easter, right? So I'd like to open with two songs this morning. And then during the sermon, you're going to hear the pastor talk about our living hope. And the only hope we have is in Jesus Christ and the blood he shed for us on Calvary. So if you haven't found that, as we just sang, don't wait till it's too late. But there was a deep chasm that was bridged by our Savior, Jesus Christ. He is our living hope. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night and through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, and Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken. I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. hallelujah. The one who set me free, hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. 
lost its grip on me You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living hope Then came the morning That sealed the promise Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me sing that again it came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to break out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Oh, Jesus, yours is the victory. Lord, hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. Resurrection Sunday. I've um, got a, a few announcements today for you guys. The mission of the month is Rock of Israel. There are envelopes on the table by the tithe box. Women's Bible study is Tuesday, April 3rd at 10 a.m. The topic is finding God's purpose for your life. And you'll meet um, in the fellowship hall and teen room. One or the other, maybe? Teen room. Yes. I knew somebody would know. Uh, backpack program. Uh, Zion Chapel will be collecting donations of notebooks and folders. Uh, there will be a sign-up sheet next week uh, to get on board for that. Joy group uh, is Tuesday, April 9th at noon. Uh, the menu for that is Sloppy Joe's. So bring your appetite. Men's breakfast, April 13th, uh, Saturday at 7.30. We'll meet at the fellowship hall for that. There's going to be a uh, prayer and praise service on Sunday, April 14th at 5 p.m. Uh, here at Zion Chapel. And then uh, there's another just kind of a general note for the Gospel Barn uh, in Bluffton, Indiana. There's a flyer for that. Uh, has some more details um, on the main bulletin board for concerts beginning in April. I have a quick word of scripture. It is Romans chapter 5 and verse number 18. It says, Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification for life. That might not sound very Eastery to many, but Easter is just another day full of sugar, Easter egg hunts, um, and bunnies uh, for those of you um, for those who don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior um, where we uh, stand different um, we like to think about his resurrection um, and what that does for us yeah. for those who are lost um, so sin entered into the world um, but death and all that didn't have victory over Jesus he, uh, he, he got the victory for us 
uh, for that so that we might be saved um, and not have to deal with that anymore. So just think about that today. If you don't know um, Jesus as your Savior today, whether you're online or here in, in the worship um, hall with us, uh, think about that. You need to get that right um, before it's forever too late. Yes. Okay, just bow your heads with me. Mm-hmm. Heavenly Father, God, we just we love you, Lord. We thank you for this day and what it stands for, God. Uh, as I said, Lord, um, I pray that if there's a lost soul here uh, that can hear my voice, I pray that they'd get it right today. Ask someone uh, about the gospel and, and just how easy it is to uh, accept Jesus as their Savior. Lord, I pray that they would get that right um, where they where they sit right now, Lord, I, I just pray that you would visit them and just nudge them in that direction, Lord. Nothing to be embarrassed about by that. Uh, that will be the best decision they've ever made. And God, I pray that you would meet with us here in a special way today. God, open our open our hearts up, clear our minds of all the worldly distractions. Um, help us to be present here in this moment as we worship you, God. And I pray that you would lift the preacher up today as he brings a special message. And, Lord, we just love you. God, we thank you for everything you do for us. And uh, I just want to pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, we're glad you have joined us here today, whether it's in person or on the live stream. Um, We have a ton of people that that reaches that our church is humongous, if you look at the big footprint. But we are here this morning to celebrate. If you were here Friday night, powerful service, really, really good, uh, great Friday service that we had. And we said, this is Friday, but what? Sunday is coming. Well, Sunday is here. And we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So if you would stand this morning, let us celebrate Jesus. on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news and out of the tomb he came with majesty and he is alive amen our god reigns how lovely are the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news good of happiness our God reigns Amen and our God 
God reigns. Well, our God reigns. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. It was our sin and guilt that bruised and wounded him. It was our sin that brought him down. When we, like sheep, had gone astray, our shepherd came, and on his shoulders he bore our shame. And I He is alive. Amen. He is alive. God loves us so. See here his hands, his feet, his side. Oh. from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph or his foes sing that hymn today pray with me. God, we thank you for the time you've allowed us to come here today to celebrate 
our hope, to celebrate our peace, and that's found in Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for you are the only one worthy of this today. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, awaiting your return to take us home. So God, we say thank you and proclaim today, worthy is the Lamb.
You may be seated this morning. We're going to do something different today. Usually this is our time of prayer and anointing. We're going to do that at the end of the service. Um, so we have one more that I want to do this morning. And um, make sure I'm in the right key here. Thank you. I don't want to be that guy. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Got a text from Callie, and those that don't go here normally, Callie and James had their little one. He's standing right there. He's perfect timing. He's showing him off. Hey. And she texted me. She said, hey, I'm planning on being there Sunday. I was like, whew, thank you, Lord. Because this song had been going over and over in my head. It starts out and it says, I am a wretch, or I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost, I was blind, and I was running out of time. But thank you, Jesus, for the blood that was applied through the cross and through this time that he conquered death and hell on the grave so we can be free this morning. Listen as Callie sings this one today. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. Running out of time. Sin separated. The beach was far too wide From the far side of the chasm You held me in your side You made a way Across the great divide Left behind heaven's throne To build it here inside And there at the cross the debt I owe broke my chains freed my soul for the first time I had hope thank you Jesus for the blood of life thank you Jesus it has washed me white thank you Jesus you have saved
Sing that again. Sing glory. thank you for that blood that was applied Father for without you we have no hope without the shedding of blood there is no peace there is no salvation we honor you today for the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. We thank you for that cleansing blood that washes over us. Father, we thank you today. Give you praise and glory. Amen. We're going to do Beacon this morning for the kids. We're not doing the preteens or the teens, so you guys can hang out here. But Beacon kids, you guys can... Head on back to the back. If you're new here to today, to today, <laughs> sorry, I stutter sometimes. Mind works faster than the mouth some days. If you're new here this morning, it's for younger kids, ages three, I think. If they're not in the diaper, send them back. We'll be okay. <laughs> I'm not changing it. So three years old to, I believe, fifth grade, I believe. Um, they can go back there, and they'll have their lesson, and activity time back there so kids you can head on back I think we have the best band at Zion Chapel. <laughs> no. Only say it's the only band we have at Zion Chapel. So, um, welcome, Hallelujah! He is risen. Jesus is risen. This week I was watching, and there was a couple little videos on YouTube, and these guys spent 35, 40 minutes debating the fact that probably the Christians have it wrong, that maybe we know the resurrection was on Sunday morning. We know the scripture says that, but they're debating the fact that it may have been Thursday when he was crucified instead of Friday. I said, who cares? He's alive. <laughs> Could have spent more time sharing the gospel message rather than debating over which day Jesus died, we know he rose on the third day. And he said he would. And so those things are just minor. The fact is that today we serve a risen Savior. The scripture says that he 
came to life. God raised him up by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the, the scripture says this, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that raises us out of our sins. Aren't you thankful for that, that God is powerful enough to remove the sin and to forgive us from the stain of sin? If you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 27. We're going to look at two different passages. Matthew chapter 27, which is kind of a takeoff from where we were on Friday evening with Good Friday. And then we'll be going into Matthew chapter 28, which describes the resurrection. Jesus died on the cross. That is a fact. Jesus was dead. He didn't faint. He didn't just have a a spell. He was beaten. He was crucified. He was speared in the side. He was beaten to a pulp. And he died. And he, on the cross, said, it is finished. When he took his last breath, it is finished. What was finished? The fact that he had finished all the work that God had sent him to do. And that he had fulfilled the plan of obtaining our salvation through shedding his blood on the cross. Matthew chapter 27, we're going to be reading, starting with verse 45. We'll be reading there. We're going to look at really this morning the fact that Jesus did rise from the grave. But what is the importance of that? The importance of the resurrection, that's what we will focus on here in a few moments, starting with verse 45 of Matthew 27. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. Jesus was on the cross. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, This man is calling for Elijah. And immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, Let him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again in a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And then, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked. And the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep or died were raised. Coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, were there looking on from afar. Among those were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Jesus was placed in the tomb. We read Friday night that he was placed in the tomb, the tomb was sealed. And then Saturday was silent. Silent Saturday. Nothing happened. Can you imagine the the minds and the hearts and the emotions of his followers who were maybe on Saturday still trying to wrap their minds around what had happened? I mean, they they witnessed with their own eyes their, their, their Lord, the one they had followed for three and three and a half years unrecognizable, beaten to a pulp on that cross. I think about the human side of that, of of how they must have felt. I say that because my wife and I watched a a movie the other night, and it was on on the the ugly sin of abortion. And I know that God can forgive sin. God forgives sin. But it was about the ugliness. And I remember as we finished that movie, as it ended, and the credits were scrolling, and it was just nothing. There was no music. There was nothing. Just the credits were scrolling. My heart still felt wounded. 
I sat there and I felt like I had been violated. I felt like there was so much emotion. And that didn't even compare to what Calvary, those that were there at Calvary witnessed. They must have been drained. They must have been emotionally spent on Saturday. And maybe even as we sang this morning, we know that because of Jesus raising from the grave, we have hope. They felt hopeless. What, what What a feeling. How are we going to deal with this? Where do we go from here? What do we do now? Remember what he said on that Sermon on the Mount when he said, if they hated me, they'll hate you? What are we going to do, guys? What are we going to do? Or did they not even speak to one another because they were so overcome? That was Saturday. Sunday was coming. Matthew chapter 28, starting with verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook with fear and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come and see where the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him. So I've I've told you. Behold, I've told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. The importance of the resurrection. I'm not going to ask a raise, to, to raise their hands today, but, but I want to ask you, and I want you to comp- contemplate this in your mind. Do I believe in the resurrection? Do I believe that the resurrection happened? I'm going to tell you what, that's the hope that we have as Christians. The resurrection is important. Today, I was thinking as we drove into town, this is very poor, poor, uh, this is a poor analogy, but Today is the Christian Super Bowl. (laughs) It's our day. Our Savior, who was dead, rose. And he's alive. And still today, 2,000 years later, he's still alive. And you know what? I, I know he's alive because he lives within me. And if you were in Christ today, you know Jesus is alive because he lives within you. I want to look at four reasons for the importance of the resurrection this morning. Number one is this, the resurrection witnesses to the immense power of God himself. 
We were talking Good Friday. On Friday evening, we were talking with a friend of ours who was here at the service, and, and, and she was saying, I've never felt this before. I've never experienced this before. And I said, you know what you were experiencing? You're experiencing the power of God. You have witnessed the power of God in action, and it has become real to you. You will not realize the power of the resurrection until you, res uh, until you know the power of God. Until you've been forgiven of your sin, until you've been, set you've been released from your past, your bondage, your sin. Because that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus came and he, he hung on a cross, but before that he went through tremendous torture and beating and whipping and humiliation. And he was placed on the cross. Nails. I was going to bring one of the spikes that I've been given through the years. People had given me spikes that were representative of those that were put through Jesus' wrists. And those that were driven through his feet. If that alone was the punishment, that would have been awful. But Jesus had been shredded with a whip. A cat of nine tails. His flesh hung on him. As he was beaten, as he lost blood, as it poured out. What a sight. What a sight. But now he's the resurrected Jesus. Something happened. Something happened. Someone has said this, and it's very real. When the angel was sitting there and the stone was rolled back, they did not have to roll back the stone to let Jesus out. They had to roll back the stone to let people see that he was not there. He was gone. As we sang this morning, gone forever, reigning at the right hand of the Father and soon to be coming back for those who are waiting for him. Praise the Lord. So the, wit the, the resurrection witnesses to the immense power of God himself. I, I want to tell you this morning, to believe in the resurrection means this. To believe in the resurrection means you have to believe in God. You, you can't do one without the other. To believe in the resurrection is to believe in God. If God exists, and he does, and if he created the universe and he has the power over it, then he has the power to raise the dead. If he does not have such power, he then is not worthy of our faith and worship. And only he who created life can resurrect it after death. Only he can reverse the hideousness of death itself. And only he can remove the sting of death and gain the victory over the grave. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Apostle Paul writes this about the resurrection and about what is coming for the believer. He says this, starting with verse 50, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? In the sight of the resurrection, in light of the resurrection, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? You see, in, in, in resurrecting Jesus from the grave, God reminds us of something. God is sovereign over life and death. He's sovereign over all of it. We have been praying for, for many folks. We've been praying for, for Teresa's brother-in-law 
that, that, that God has, it, God is resurrecting. Glenn, who is here, who was in a motorcycle accident last year, it's God that raised him up. It's God that sustains. It's God that gives life. There have been others here that have lost loved ones and gone on. I was thinking that on our, our elders prayer list as we, we're, we go, whenever Teresa gives a report, Russ puts it out to us because he's the elder there and, and he's putting this out. We're going, boy, God is good. Look what God's doing. Isn't God amazing? And we just continue to, to get these reports. And I was thinking of our brother Rex that sometimes he will respond praying praying for the family and I know he is I know he is but imagine his feelings that last year his brother almost a day almost to the day when Glenn had a motorcycle accident Rex's brother was involved in a motorcycle accident and he went on Who's in control over all this? God. Amen. He's sovereign. We don't understand his ways. We don't understand all the times and the, and the things that he's doing, but he is sovereign over life and death. He has purposes and plans we know not of. We have to trust him. We have to trust him. Jesus was resurrected from the grave by the power of God. So the resurrection witnesses to the power of God over life and over death. Number two, the resurrection validates who Jesus claimed to be. We know that in Jesus' ministry, you read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you get, you get the, the, the clear picture that Jesus says, I am the Son of God. I am my father's son, I am, I am, I am. So many I am's in there. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the door. I'm the bread of life. Anyone comes, if you're thirsty, come to me because I am what? The living water. Jesus is the great I am and he claimed to be the son of God. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ is important because it validates who Jesus claimed to be. Who is he? The Son of God, the Messiah. Amen. That's who he was, and that's what this proves and validates through the resurrection. I remember when Jesus came on the scene when his friend Lazarus had died. And Jesus comes on the scene, and, and, and they were heartbroken because Lazarus had been in the grave for four days. If you talk to anyone around here, if you've been in the grave for four days, stay there. <laughs> well, one of his sisters said this. When Jesus said, I know he'll, he'll be raised in the resurrection, and, and, and she goes, I know he'll be raised in the resurrection. And he goes, well, hey, roll back the, the stone here. Let's, let's roll this stone away. And she goes, well, but Lord, he's, he's, he stinketh. That's the King James Version. He, stink, he stinks. I mean, he's been dead for four days. And he's been wrapped up. But what did Jesus do? Oh, well, you're, you're probably right. No. He stood there, and after he had wept, he said, Lazarus, Come forth. Can you imagine the crowd? Here comes Lazarus. And Jesus said, cut him loose, turn him, turn him free. Unwrap him. The same power when Jesus spoke is the same power that Heavenly Father spoke and raised Jesus from the dead. 
Jesus was God incarnate, God in the flesh. According to Jesus, his resurrection, meaning his own resurrection, was the sign from heaven that authenticated his ministry. There's a time over in Matthew 16 where the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and, and they, were, they were questioning him about so many things and, and they wanted him to do signs. They wanted him to perform uh, something to make us believe that you are who you say you are. And look what Jesus says to them in the first four verses of Matthew 16. It's interesting that the Pharisees, who were very religious, the Sadducees, who were those who did not believe, they were religious, but they didn't believe in the resurrection. They did not believe that anyone, there was any hope beyond the grave. Some say that's how they got their name. That's why they were sad, you see. Sadducees. That was just their sect, their religious sect order. With the Pharisees and the Sadducees came and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. And he answered and he said to them, well, when it's evening, you say, it'll be fair weather. You know why? The sky's red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today because the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he walked away from them, he left them, and departed. So what is the sign of the prophet Jonah? If we go back to the Old Testament, we could read through the book of Jonah, which is a very short book. wouldn't take you long to read through it. But as you look at Jonah, Jonah was given a, a command from the Lord to go to Nineveh and to preach to them and warn them that, that there was judgment coming. And Jonah took off and he said, I don't want to go there. I'm not going there. Don't want to do it. And so he took a different route and he got on a boat and he's out there and, and he's asleep in this boat, but all of a sudden, because of his disobedience, a storm comes up. You know, sometimes that happens in our lives, right? Sometimes because of our disobedience, storms come into our lives. But that happened with him and it was so fierce. It says that the, the, the sailors were there and they were calling out to their God saying, oh God, oh God, oh God. And that wasn't the God of the universe. They're gods. And they finally wake Jonah up and say, why don't you get up and pray to your God? Maybe he'll hear. Maybe one of these gods will hear. And Jonah gets up and he realizes the mess that they're in and he says, just throw me overboard, guys. Because of me. Throw me overboard. But what God do? God prepared a big fish that came along and swallowed Jonah. I'm going to tell you something. We get the idea that Jonah was in a five-star hotel down there. Everything was provided for him. That's not the case. He died. You can't live in a fish like that. But guess what? Three days later, three days later, the fish comes and vomits, sorry, we haven't had lunch yet, but it vomits Jonah out on the shore. And he's alive. You see, Jesus was using that as a picture that what would happen to him was just like Jonah. And these guys knew the Old Testament. They knew that story. And he said, the same sign will be with my resurrection the third day. You see, the resurrection of Jesus was attend, or attested to by hundreds of eyewitnesses. And you know what that does? That provides irrefutable proof that he is the Savior of the world. 
1 Corinthians 15. The first part of 1 Corinthians 15 says this, verses 3 through 8. The Apostle Paul again preaching, he says, this is what I want to deliver to you. That first of all, which I also received, I got this from the Lord, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Do you believe that? And that He was buried. Do you believe that? And that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Do you believe that? And that He was seen by Cephas, which was Peter, and then by the twelve. And after that, He was seen by over 500 brethren of whom, or at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. They've, went, they've died again. And after that he was seen by James and then by all the apostles. And then last of all, he was seen by me, Paul says, uh, as one who was born out of due time. Jesus fulfilled the word of God. He died according to the scriptures. He was buried according to the scriptures. He was raised again to life according to the scriptures on the third day. So he proved that he was the Messiah. He was who he claimed to be. Number three, the resurrection of Jesus Christ proves his sinless character and his divine nature. If you're reading through the Psalms, you can read many times this this phrase about God's Holy One, His Holy One. The Scripture said God's Holy One would never see corruption. That's what it says in the Old Testament. Many hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born, He would never see corruption. That Jesus never did see corruption even after He died. Meaning His body did not rot or decay. In Psalm 16, verse 10, it says, For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, which is the place of the dead, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. In Acts, chapter 13, verses 32 to 37, listen to this, because the apostles, the ones who had witnessed the, the, the death, the crucifixion, and the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus said this, and we declare to you glad tidings. <laughs> and we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for, for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus. And it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And that, he was, and that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus, this is what he spoke, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, meaning he died and he was buried with his fathers, and he saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Hundreds of years before Jesus was even born, this was prophesied. You see, Paul and the apostles, they're preaching was based on the basis of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Paul preached this in Acts 13, 38 and 39, if we'd go on in the scripture, it says, through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, listen, everyone who believes is set free from sin. Isn't that good news? Yes. Everyone who believes in him is set free from sin. Are you bound by sin today? Are you into things in your life that's got you bound and held back and you feel like you are, are struggling and you're strangling in your sin? Jesus came to set you free. And he can do that if you allow him to do that. Jesus 
forgives our sins if we'll come and ask. If we'll humble ourselves before Him, He'll forgive us for our sins. And everyone, another part of Scripture, Romans 10, 13 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Number four, the resurrection validates the Old Testament prophecies of Jesus' suffering and resurrection. I was looking this up this week and in the Bible, in the Bible there's some 1,817 prophecies. 1,817 prophecies. In the Old Testament, there was 1,239. In the Old Testament, the New Testament, 578. So 1,817 prophecies in the Bible. One event, just when Jesus was born, when we celebrate Christmas and the birth of Jesus Christ, when Jesus was born, there were almost 333 of those prophecies fulfilled just in his birth. Those prophecies who said, this is who's coming. This is where he will be born. This is who he will be born of. Those prophecies, seven, eight hundred years, a thousand years before, his birth were all fulfilled. Boom. He fulfilled all 333 of those. Just when they, Joseph smacked him on the rear and he took his first breath. Those prophecies had been fulfilled. I think how good this little new baby is in church here today. Sullivan. Sullivan James Sayer. Newborn baby. I wonder how many prophecies were fulfilled when when Sully was born. What has God prophesied for his life, our lives? What's God's plan? For our life. God has a plan for the little baby. And so God has a plan for each one of us. And as we as we live our life, we have to realize that when God says something in the Bible, in the Word of God, it's true. And we can depend on it. But the resurrection validated the Old Testament prophecies of Jesus' suffering and resurrection. We see some of the examples of this. In fact, the resurrection of Jesus Christ also validates the Old Testament prophecies that, that, that told certain things about how he would die. The type of death. When we read Isaiah chapter 53, when it talks about the Lamb of God He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And he was beaten. He was cruelly treated. And after all of those things and the way he was treated, the thing that jumps out to us and stands out to me greatly is the fact that when he was being treated that way, it says he opened his mouth. Not a time. He didn't open his mouth. He didn't resist, but all that was prophesied. This message that we have today, we call it the gospel. You know what gospel really means? Good news. It's good news. The scripture says the wages of sin is death, and all of us have been sinners, that's for sure. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul defended the gospel message. The apostles defended the gospel message to the point that most of them died, were martyred for their preaching the gospel message. 
In Acts chapter 17, Paul is preaching and it says this in verses 2 and 3. As his custom was, he went in to them, meaning into those that he was trying to teach and he went into the, the synagogue. And for three Sabbaths, so for three, we'd say Sundays, but Sabbaths for them on Saturday, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying this, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. He's the real deal. And today I'm going to tell you what, in 2024, from this pulpit, from the word of God, we want to tell you Jesus Christ is still the real deal. Amen. He's the real deal. You can trust him. You can place your faith in him and know that your sins can be forgiven and you can have that assurance of eternal life. You see, Christ's resurrection also authenticated his own claims that he would be raised on the third day. Let me give you three examples from Mark chapter 8, verse 31. Jesus talking to his disciples and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Jesus began teaching them, this is what's going to happen. In Mark chapter 9, verse 31, for he taught his disciples and he said to them, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. In Mark 10, 33 and 34, he says, behold, guys, we're going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes. They will condemn him to death. They will deliver him to the Gentiles and they will mock him and scourge him, meaning whip him and spit on him and kill him. And the third day, he will rise again. Three places here recorded of Jesus' teaching. I asked you earlier if you believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want to make this statement. If Jesus Christ is not resurrected, if that didn't happen, then we have no hope that we will be either. There's no hope if Jesus has not been resurrected. Our message is garbage. In fact, apart from Christ's resurrection, we have no Savior. We have no salvation. We have no hope of eternal life. That's if the resurrection did not happen. As Paul said, our faith, if that were the case, our faith would be useless. The gospel would be altogether powerless. And here's the worst part our sins would remain forever unforgiven. No hope. No hope without the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I've used this passage, we've went around this two times already, but I'm going to catch the middle part of this, verses 14 and 19 of 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul says this, and if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if the resurrection is not true. If in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. And then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And he goes on to clear it with this. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. We are to be pitied. 
if there's no resurrection. Because we place hope in this life, and if this is the only life we have hope in, pitiful. We're going to perish away from God when we die. But because of the resurrection, Jesus gave us hope. So, so Paul is, is really capping here that there is no resurrection. There's no way we're going to make it in, into heaven. We're not going to be even raised from the dead if there was no resurrection of Christ. No eternal life. But I'm here to tell you today that Jesus does more than give life. He is life. <laughs> Jesus is life. And because he is life, that is why death has no power over him. Remember what Jesus told his disciples in John 14? When they were saying, hey, you're going away, but we don't know where you're going. And how do we get to the Father? Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus confers his life on us. The ones who trust in him. Why does he do that? So we can triumph over death. <laughs> Some of us are closer to the grave than others. And maybe not. We don't know. See, we always assume that the older people, right? They're the, old, they're, they're the ones going on. But just because you're young, don't think you've got a free ride. Amen. Because life is uncertain. Us older ones may be going on, but if Jesus doesn't come back, you'll soon follow. Because life goes very, very quickly. 1 John chapter 5. Listen to these encouraging words from John who wrote the book of John, who wrote Revelation, who wrote the epistles, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. He says, this is the testimony. We can witness to this, folks. He says that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Listen to this. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. No hope, no promise after this life. It's only through Jesus. You see, we believe in Jesus Christ. And those of us who believe in Jesus Christ will personally experience a resurrection because of this. We have the life that Jesus gives if we're saved. We have the life that He gives. With Him, we can overcome death. The scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, we've already read it, it is impossible for death to win if you were in Christ. Jesus led the way in life after death. And as Christians, we know that God became a man. He died for our sins. He was buried. And he was resurrected the third day. Here's something, you go up to the cemetery and you see that those who have passed have been put in the ground and planted in the ground and they're in a vault and only God could bring them out and he will someday. Amen. Only God could bring them out. But it's impossible for death to win over the believer. The grave could not hold him. He lives. And he sits today at the right hand of the Father in heaven, alive, waiting for the God the Father to say, go get my children, bring them home. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 12 says it this way. 
But this man, meaning Jesus, the man, who became man, flesh, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. That's where he is today. The Word of God guarantees the believer's resurrection at the coming of Jesus Christ for his church at what we call the rapture. Such assurance results in a great song of triumph. Paul gives us this idea in 1 Corinthians 15, 55. We said it earlier, but it says this. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? It's almost like a little kid. Catch this? Like a little kid when they got one on you. <laughs> Where, O oh death, is your victory? We've lost several of our church folk through the years. The last couple, three years have been tough. But those that died believing in Jesus Christ could be like the little kid. Oh, oh, death, where's your sting? Where's your victory? Nothing, because I'm, I'm, I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. So the word of God guarantees the believer's resurrection. Those who have died in Christ, guaranteed, going to be resurrected, be raised and meeting God. You see, the resurrection is the triumphant and the glorious victory for every believer. For every believer. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, For I delivered you, first of all, that I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and He was buried, that He was rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And here's something we know that's not in that passage, is that He is coming again. He's coming again. The dead in Christ will be raised up. Those who were alive at His coming will be changed, receive new glorified bodies. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 and 17 says this, there's a day coming and it may be very soon, folk. Maybe very soon. It says this, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall what? Always be with the Lord. That's the hope of the believer. That's the assurance of those who have placed their faith in their trust in Jesus Christ. Why is the resurrection of Jesus Christ important? Well, I think we've looked at four things today that kind of prove that without it, we're toast. Without the resurrection, there's no hope. The resurrection proves who Jesus is. The resurrection demonstrates that, that God accepted Jesus' sacrifice as a payment of sin on our behalf. It shows that God has the power to raise us up from the dead. And it guarantees that the body of those who believe in Christ will not remain dead, but will be resurrected unto eternal life. The hope of the resurrection. That's why the resurrection of Jesus Christ is important. That's the importance of the resurrection. Now, let's say this next slide together, if we would. Ready? One, two, three. Hallelujah! He is risen. Can you imagine that? That sounded great, by the way. What will heaven be like? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who is, who was, who is to come. 
He is risen. And because He is risen, that's why we can have hope today. And I want you to know that if you've not confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if you've not come and taken Him on in your life, you've not asked Him to be the Lord of your life, the leader of your life, the boss, let's put it that way. If you haven't asked Him to do that, today's the day. I don't know if you've been following the news at all. I don't follow much of it. Make you sick. But, but, but don't follow much of the news. But what I have been following is this. To know that when Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 24 the things that would be happening in the last days before he came, they're happening. They're happening. Folk, if, if the birth pains that Jesus spoke about were the Richter scale for earthquakes, sometimes there's movement in the ground that's happening all the time. But what happens when there's a tremor? What happens when there's an earthquake? That's what's happening right now. Things are moving fast. Jesus is coming back. He's going to come, and who's he coming for? Those who are prepared, who are eagerly looking for him right now. Are you looking for the Lord right now? Are you going on with life like it's going on forever, and I don't care? There's coming a day you will care. And you're going to say, maybe someday, I'm, I think about this many times, a folk who maybe have sat under our hearing of, of, of preaching of the word or maybe on the live stream, someone's watched it, and maybe it gets to this point of the service, maybe, and, 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 and some of them just go, you know what, I think I'll turn it off now because he just does that all the time. Old Fuddy Dud <laughs> says the same thing all the time, just blowing hot air. There's going to come a day if you reject Christ when you will get on your hands and your knees and you will beg God for forgiveness and you won't find it. And you will say, I wish I would have listened to that footy dud. Right. I wish I would have paid attention. I wish I would have gave my heart to Jesus. Oh, how I wish I would have listened. And that will go on for eternity. We are close to Jesus coming. I don't know the day or the hour. No one knows the day or the hour, but I think we're in the season. And you say, well, people have said that before, but the Richter scale wasn't doing what it's doing now. If you are living your life contrary to God's word, if you're just living life and, and you're saying, you know what, hey, I'm just going to do like they did in the Old Testament. You see, Israel got in trouble. And what was it they got in trouble for? Whenever man was just doing what was right in their own eyes instead of what God's word said. You want to be right with God? You can get right with God today. You can bow your heart right now. You can, you, while I'm up here blowing off, you can be praying. You can confess that you're a sinner. I know you're a sinner. You say, well, how judgmental. Know the scripture. Well, God's word already says, for all have sinned. Yeah. I mean, that's including me. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And you know what? Don't think you can try to get your act together before you come to Christ because it's never going to happen. You come to Christ and He'll get your act together. He will get your act together. when his disciples were out fishing on the boats and he said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. 
You see, here's the thing. We have a, we have a job. We have a task. And that is to go out and catch fish. Men. Catch men. Women. To, to get them to see the light of the gospel. Someone said it this way. God says, you catch them, I'll clean them. I'll take care of them. God's sure done a lot of cleanup in my life. How about yours? And he's able to do that. He's capable of doing that. Most of all, the most important news is this. All that ugly black sin in your life, because of the blood that he just shed on Calvary, that we're celebrating the death on the cross. The blood of Christ can take that sin and wipe it away. And we're forgiven, clean. Where are you today? Are you here and you say, you know what? Or maybe you're listening on the live stream. Man, my life's a mess. As some of our brothers have shared in here, Rex has shared with us, he's been vulnerable to share with us that when, when he came to church, he's, he thought, you know, I'm too bad. I don't even know if God can forgive me. There's proof God can forgive you. None of us are beyond the reach of God. And the same power that Jesus was raised with, that raised him from the dead is the same one that can raise you right out of your sin and give you life, life eternal. You know how much God loves you? Romans 5, 8 says this, God demonstrated his love this way in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how much he loves us. John three sixteen says, for God so loved the world and the world is us. For God so loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. What's your choice? If God's calling you today, if you feel the tug of your heart. You know the Holy Spirit is pulling you in and saying, you got to get right with God. Today's the day. As we pray, you can just humbly say, God, I'm a sinner. I recognize that today I'm a sinner. I'm lost. And I need you in my life. God, I ask you to to forgive my sin. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm dirty. I'm, I'm unholy. My life's a mess. It's a wreck. And I need you to come in and straighten out my life. Forgive my sin. Cleanse me. Make me clean. Help me to turn my life and repent from my sin, to turn away from my sin and begin to follow Jesus Christ. God, come into my life today. Father, I thank you for the hearts that you're dealing with today. You're such a great God, an awesome God, that you could take old sinners like us those who have done things that we would never talk about, we're ashamed of. And you've forgiven us. And you've made us clean. You've made us whole. You took the broken pieces of our life and you brought it back together. God, the same power that you used to raise your son, Jesus, from the grave is the same power not only that you'll raise us up, but you will give us this power to to live within us through the Holy Spirit to empower us to live a godly life. Thank you, Father, for those I believe who are calling on your name today. 
Father, help us. Help us to know. Help us to come to an understanding that we can help these that are just getting started. Father, thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace. Thank you for Jesus who willingly laid down his life and let them drive nails through his hands and feet. He took the whipping, the beating, the the torture that should have been ours for our sin and he took it on his shoulders and on his back and on his body. And Father, we give you thanks for Jesus, your son. And thank you, God, for raising him up because that's the hope we have as believers. That just as Jesus was resurrected, he defeated death. He was victorious over death because he was, we can be. And we will be by placing our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer this day. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 If you have the elements, we want to recognize Jesus through the Lord's Supper. We shared this on Friday evening. We're sharing it today. We'll share it again next Sunday as the first Sunday of the month. God willing. But Jesus said this, when you come together and you do this, as often as you do it, would you remember me? Remember what I did for you. So if you remember Jesus today, just go back with me just in your memory, just a minute, where Paul said this, on the night Jesus was betrayed, He had a meal with them, and after the meal, he took and he took the bread and he blessed it. And he passed it around to the disciples, and he said, Here, take and eat of it. This represents my body. So today, as we take this together, let's remember Jesus and his body that he laid down for us willingly. Let's eat together. And Paul says, in the same manner, after they had eaten the bread, Jesus took the cup and he passed it and he said, here, take and drink, all of you. Take and drink it because this is a representation of my blood. My body and my blood and the blood that was going to be poured out for our salvation. So as we drink of this together, would you remember Jesus and what he did for you? As I close in prayer here, and then the elders will be available after this prayer. If you have a prayer need and you would like to come up, you can do that. The elders would come now. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we just want to say thank you. Oh, our thanks, Father, is seeming to be falling way short of what we owe Jesus. What a privilege it is to have a Savior who could have went back to glory. He could have been delivered from this and not gone through with the plan and then we would have had no hope for eternal life no hope for forgiven sin father we're so thankful for jesus as if we we have just shared this these elements together the bread and the, and the cup father we pray that you would help us to take to heart the seriousness of what jesus did for us For those of us who are saved, those of us who have a relationship with you, Father, may we step out of our comfort zones and may we minister like we never have before until Jesus comes. And for those who are coming to Christ today, Father, we believe that there are many. And we give you thanks for that. We just pray, Lord, that your hand will be upon them. And as we leave this place today, our our, our intent is to spend time with family, 
friends. God, may we encourage one another during this season in which we live. Thank you for the resurrection day. A long time ago, 2,000 years ago, Jesus raised from the dead, but we still remember it today because it's a marker in our Christian lives to remember Jesus. Thank you, Father, for also new life here in the spring. New life through Jesus Christ. So, Father, go with us now. Keep your hand upon us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you and thank you for being here.